From WAMU 88.5 at American University in Washington, welcome to the Kojo Nandi Show, connecting your neighborhood with the world. Muriel Bowser is now one year into her term as mayor of the District of Columbia, and her list of resolutions for the year ahead is a daunting one, bringing down homicides from the highest rate the city has seen in years, keeping family homelessness in check as the cold weather sets in, and sticking to a promise to expand the city's stock of affordable housing as many neighborhoods continue to go farther and farther out of reach for all but the city's wealthiest residents. Muriel Bowser joins us in studio. Mayor Bowser, Happy New Year. Thank you for happy joining us. Happy New Year, Kojo. Thank you for having me. Crime was not one of the issues that dominated the conversation when you were running for mayor, but since you've taken office, homicides have risen to a level the city hasn't seen in years, and the nationwide conversation about policing, race, and accountability has boiled over into our region as well. What lessons did you take out of your first year in office when it comes to crime, and how are those lessons informing your plans for the year ahead? Well, well, certainly uh, making our neighborhood safer and stronger is uh, number one on my agenda. And I think it is true that big cities around our country uh, did not expect uh, to see spikes in violent crime, and we've seen it all over uh, the the nation. Uh, our crime story is a, is a bit mixed in Washington, as, as you probably are aware, where we have concentrated uh, areas of violent crime. Uh, and we're also really working on a modest increase in robbery, but still one that is very troubling. Overall, um, when we look at all the other categories of crime, we actually see reductions or we see those areas flat. So our approach, Kojo, has been uh, to, to act aggressively, put all the resources we have around it. Uh, and today, especially, we've been talking about a legislative package that we have before the council that we think can also be helpful. Yeah, you signed a bill last week that will require all police officers to be equipped with body cameras by next summer. What are you hoping to get out of that program and outside of video, where do you think it's necessary to have accountability for officer conduct? Well, I, I think that uh, we, we have been bold about this. I actually introduced uh, the notion of having all of our patrol officers have body cameras in my first budget um, that I pre uh, presented to the council last spring uh, that would fund the body-worn camera program at $5.1 million. Um, so we've worked uh, in partnership with the council to not only make sure we have the funding, um, which we are grateful that they supported uh, recently, but also now to have the rules in place about how body-worn footage can be available. It's one of those things that we think is going to uh, support better police-community relations. Uh, we have enjoyed good police and community relations in Washington. Not always the case, but um, certainly we think our force has earned the respect and trust uh, of neighborhoods, but we recognize that that's a fragile situation that we always have to uh, nurture. Uh, and having accountability for police and for communities all at the same time with the cameras is a, is a good thing. If you have questions or comments for Mayor Bowser, you can call us at 800-433-8850. You can send email to kojo at wamu.org or shoot us a tweet at Kojo Show. When Police Chief Kathy Lanier joined us this past August, she said she was frustrated that some people didn't understand that a lot of your plan to reduce crime isn't even about policing. A lot of it is about factors that might contribute to crime. And I'm looking at a report put out um, a few days ago by the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University School of Law, which says that the, a handful of cities have seen sharp rises in murder rates, but just two cities, Baltimore and Washington, D.C., account for almost 50 percent of the national increase in murders, that these serious increases seem to be localized rather than part of a national pandemic suggesting community conditions are a major factor. They go on to talk about low incomes, higher poverty, higher unemployment. Do you see all of those as factors? Uh, well, certainly we know that when uh, as part of our job in dealing with public safety is to make sure people have more opportunities. So I don't know, um, I'm, I'm not familiar with that study or the numbers. I certainly don't think uh, the numbers in Washington and Baltimore are the same or which ones are weighted in that study. Uh, but uh, we have focused, I think, 
you know, and I'm quite sure that the reason why uh, we went out to campaign and people elected me was to focus on building prosperity in Washington, but including more Washingtonians in it. So one big theme of, of my administration is how do we get more Washingtonians in the jobs that we create uh, in Washington? And actually in this year, Kojo, we have seen unemployment numbers fall in the district uh, by a full 1%. Uh, we have also uh, made sure that we're looking at new programs like uh, our expansion of the summer youth program up to 24-year-olds, our creation of the LEAP program um, that uh, puts D.C. government uh, to, I'm sorry, D.C. residents who have had particularly, uh, you know, difficult times finding work um, and training them for D.C. Um, government jobs. Also, in our Safer, Stronger Supplemental, we secured funding for 400 jobs for um, at-risk folks that we know that we can identify and put in work um, year-round and work training. Uh, we will make neighborhoods safer and stronger. Telephone number again, 800-433-8850. Let's start with Pepin in Washington, D.C. Pepin, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Uh, thanks, Kojo. Uh, and congratulations, Madam Mayor, on, uh, on the anniversary of your inauguration. Thank you. Um, so on the crime question, one of the issues that I think comes up often is the relationship between the district government and the federal government, which prosecutes crime in the city. And there's been a lot of discussion about whether um, – the U.S. Attorney's Office has priorities um, in prosecuting crimes that sort of are more significant and go beyond uh, prosecuting things like simple assaults and other misdemeanors in the city. And so my question is recognizing that uh, there would be a need to seek congressional approval and staff up prosecutors in the Office of the Attorney General or elsewhere. Um, do you think that uh, expanding home rule to allow the district to prosecute its own crimes in the city, its own misdemeanors, might help us be able to deal with some of the increases in crime problems that we've seen? Well, I always I, the question you were really asking um, in, my, in my mind is about statehood and if the district should act like more of a state um, and have the powers that states have. So my, my answer to, to that question is always going uh, to, to be yes. Uh, you also rightly point out that there are a lot of uh, not insignificant um, steps to getting there. And uh, so we always want to make sure that we have, that we can hold prosecutors more accountable to the values of the people of the District of Columbia. Uh, and also, having said that, uh, I have had the opportunity to meet uh, with the new U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia, express in no uncertain terms how important it is for people um, who harm uh, the peace and public safety of the district um, to be brought to justice and held accountable for their crimes. So we're looking forward. I know the chief um, is is also working hand in hand um, with the U.S. attorney on the particular areas of crime increase that are affecting our neighborhoods. Black Lives Matter pr protesters took to the streets in D.C. on New Year's Eve, and one of the names that came up in their chance was Alonzo Smith, the young man who died after an interaction with security guards late last year. You ordered the release of police body camera footage from that scene. What, uh, why did you do that? What informed your decision to do that? Uh, well, Kojo, I think um, we have, for this, for the better part of this last year, talked about more transparency and accountability when it comes um, to policing. That's why we wanted the body cameras. And uh, with the legislation that I recently signed confirmed uh, my ability as mayor uh, to look at uh, footage that would not normally be available through the FOIA process like this one was and make a determination um, and to see if it is of great public interest and if it is uh, to to release it. Now, obviously, we have to balance what's in the public interest and uh, the fairness of a, a criminal investigation, uh, and that's what we, we try to do. Uh, it is my view that if there's an in-custody death, um, and uh, this one was not in the case, uh, Mr. Smith's, um, it was not a metropolitan police officer involved, um, but it was a, a still a person in legal custody custody. And so I think that bears a significant scrutiny, and that's why I released it. On now to Noor Ali, who is in Ward 8. Noor Ali, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Yes, Kojo. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Happy New Year. Hi. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Mr. Kojo. Uh, thank you. Allow me. Happy New uh, Year. First, 
uh, first of all, I, I really am. I really am so proud that I really I support you, and that uh, what you're doing is so far first year. Congratulations! You Thank did you. A good job. Thank you. Oh, I thought you and, were talking about me, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wishing next three years you would do better. Thank uh, you. Because what I learned in living in, in the city for 30 years. I, I never get used to uh, when the leader is really humble, you know, he or she herself. And when people, you know, point, point finger her whether it's a fresh bag or some other thing, you know, she just focus and make sure what people who put her in the office. And I really I like that. That's the transparency, number one. And I really I like more. But you had a more I specific concern, or didn't you? Uh, yes, but so far I'm not complaining, but at this first year, if I give a great mayor, I give B+. Plus. Thank and you. And I appreciate that for your service, Ms. May. Well, thank you. Well, I'll keep working on that A. I thought you had a concern about policing in Ward 8. Yes, I see a, a, we need more police appearance in the street uh, uh, in Ward 8 and, and, and to educate, and, and, and we need a more educate between the police. I really am uh, so... Uh, uh, I really admire now the police force and the community. They would get along each other, and hopefully, it's not going to be overnight. But at least we need more times and, and convince the community we are working side by side. Right. Yes, you you're, know, you're, I, I, I you're founding the mayor on what I call her safe, stronger DC tour right. today because Ward 8, Ward 8 is one of the places included in that tour. Yes, and what uh, what Mr. Ali talked about is was what I hear all the time is that we want to see more. Um, we want to have more police presence, but not just um, police as an occupying force, but a police that are working uh, hand in hand uh, with the community, getting out of cars, walking down streets, knocking on doors uh, when there's no time of trouble, but just to get uh, to know uh, the community. So when we talk about uh, neighborhoods who have been most hard hit by crime, wanting more police and needing more police, uh, that's the type of policing we're talking about. I was talking about you're going to have lunch at Mama's place Mama's today. Kitchen, yes. Mama's Kitchen and over in Ward 8 today because that place had been robbed several times during the course of the past year. So what? speaking about the police conversations, what conversations have you had with the police chief recently about the size of the police force? She said that going below 3,800 officers puts the city in dangerous territory. On the other hand, Council Chairman Phil Mendelson told the Post that 3,800 isn't a magic number, that the bigger question is whether the force is built to handle the current challenges of the city. How do you see it? Well, uh, we want to have a, a strong force. I think one thing that we know is that our city continues to grow. Uh, we continue to have a thousand people move here, more businesses, more people um, going to places where they hadn't worked or lived or traveled before. Uh, so we know that means that we need to make sure we have a pipeline to grow our force. And the number, as long as I've been in D.C. government, has been to make sure that we're funding uh, to get to, to 4,000. Uh, now, we also are not surprised by the fact that this marks the year where a lot of uh, police officers are eligible uh, for retirement and are taking advantage of retirement. Uh, so we have to hire officers, we have to retain officers, and we have to continue to fund to get to the levels uh, where we think we need to be. We have an email from Eric, speaking of affordable housing, who writes... The term affordable is at question. Right now, the city defines affordable at 80% of the area median income. AMI includes two of the wealthiest counties in the country, Fairfax and Montgomery counties. Because of this, 80% of AMI sets affordable rents for a studio at around $1,500 a month and can be available for an individual making $60,000 a year. This disingenuous definition of affordable has only exacerbated the affordability crisis in the district. Well, actually, when we talk about affordability, I, I think the goal has always been that a person doesn't spend more than 30 percent of their income on housing. Uh, we know that when people are spending 40 and 50 percent of their income, it makes them a very, we, uh, we use the term housing uh, vulnerable, and it puts them really uh, on the edge. So our, our attack around affordability 
affordable housing is is key um, to how we ensure uh, a pathway to the middle class for Washingtonians. So I promised that we would uh, invest $100 million in the Affordable Housing Production Trust Fund, which we did, which meant making up about $45 million out of the general fund. Uh, I promised that we would use government land um, and ensure that whatever deals we made, if we were going to develop on government land, that at least 30 percent of the housing uh, would be affordable. And that means um, providing um, significant buy-downs to make those units affordable. I also promised that we would look at the vulnerable units in our city um, who will have federal tax credits expiring over the next 10 years. Um, and we created a, a strike force that to examine, because, Kojo, this is a, a area in preservation uh, where we are not really funded to deal with. So if we have a building that has an expiring tax credit, we have no ability right now um, to really be able to stand in, in the breach and help uh, and help those tenants. We're also taking a fresh look at IZ uh, to make sure that it uh, has all of the, the teeth it needs, but is also properly incentivizes the private development community to produce affordable housing units all over the city. Welcome back. Our guest is Mayor Muriel Bowser of the District of Columbia. She joins us in studio. We just mentioned Council Chairman Phil Mendelson. He had told the Post recently that some of the friction between you and the Council, the bumps, so to speak, have been about toning down your political operation. What would you say you've learned during this past year about striking a balance between the need to assert yourself politically and governing effectively? Well, I, I, um, I kind of see them all the same. Um, I was sent to uh, the Wilson building to, to move an agenda, and an agenda that's focused on affordable housing and on growing prosperity uh, for all Washingtonians. And so any anything that uh, I, I bring uh, to the council, uh, it's, not, it's not personal and it's not political, frankly. It is um, moving the agenda that I was elected uh, to accomplish. Your supporters, some of them, caused a great deal of consternation when they set up a political action committee called Fresh Pack. They shut it down after critics cried foul, claiming that a pack with the ability to raise unlimited contributions to support your agenda opened up too many possibilities for pay-to-play politics. You campaigned on the idea that the city needed to turn the page from the scandal over Mayor Gray's election and his time as mayor. To what degree were you concerned? that the existence of this fresh pack made you, well, look like a hypocrite? Oh, I don't think I look like a hypocrite at all. I think it's very, uh, having a pack. we know if you look at any state across the nation and you look at congressional seats, um, that political leaders uh, have packs. What concerned me was that the message uh, wasn't a message that I would support uh, and, and that going after, you know, pol you know, people who uh, may or may not uh, vote with you is not what, our, what we're about. What we're about is making sure uh, that people uh, know that we're moving a tough agenda. Uh, we want to communicate that agenda well to the people of, of Washington, D.C., get support for those things, and, and be successful. Um, and I actually think that we'll do that uh, in partnership uh, with, with the council. Well, Colby King wrote at the time that what you needed was a true friend, that you had more than enough cronies, and that there needed to be someone who should have been able to advise you that the optics of fresh back would look bad. When it was first, when it was initially suggested, you didn't think at all that the optics might look bad? To, to have a pack? I to mean, have a I, pack. I wonder Which if you people would... who want to do business with the city or who do business with the city can make generous well, well, contributions? Like I, well, like I said, Kojo, what I think was, was not correct about it was uh, I think that the PAC should have more c clearly communicated what it wanted to be about. And it was about supporting a positive agenda, uh, not about kind of being a, a political uh, uh, entity. Here now is Mike in Tacoma Park, Maryland. Mike, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Kojo. Uh, uh, Mayor, um, also, I want to give you congratulations Thank on the you. anniversary of your inaugural. Thank you. Uh, and I, I want to say I called because I, I really support your efforts on green energy. I know the city made the largest wind purchase, I think, of any city in America. You were recognized at the Paris Climate Talk. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. I, 
However, I'm, I'm very disappointed by your support for the Exxon Pepco merger because uh, as a leader of a regional environmental group, I, I do not believe it's good for the environment. And particularly what's, the, what's, the, what's the name? What's the name of your group? It's the Chesapeake Climate Action Network. Oh, okay. And, uh, Mayor, you said earlier that your actions as mayor are not political. They're about advancing an agenda. But when last month we found out that the head of your political action committee, Fresh Pack, Chico Horton, was hired by Exelon and, uh, to lobby you on the proposed Exelon Pepco merger, why shouldn't we all just see this as politics? And I wonder if... Now that we know the head of your PAC, now this bandit was hired to lobby your administration on this merger, do you agree with others who say there should be a, a pause on this, that we should have more time to review exactly what happened here? No, Mike, actually, I think that um, I can tell you what happened. We put together a very robust uh, package of benefits for the residents of the District of Columbia, just like uh, four other jurisdictions have done. I'm not sure if you're in Tacoma, D.C. or Tacoma Park, Maryland. He's in Maryland. Uh, but if you're in Maryland, just like uh, your county executive did uh, to support uh, the needs of Prince George. County or Montgomery County uh, in moving uh, in making sure that we secured our energy future. So what I what our administration has done is really no different than the others. But uh, we were last, and actually we were in a very good position to take a deal that was 14 million dollars and convert it to a deal that was 77 million dollars, a deal that included um, residential credits for for ratepayers, a deal that included includes investments in, in solar energy and wind energy, a deal that includes uh, support um, and protection for low-income homeowners and apartment dwellers, uh, and it also includes very, very aggressive um, investments in job training. Uh, we also secured the, the East Coast headquarters of Exelon. Uh, so the Exelon is going to be a major player on the East Coast, uh, and we secured those jobs in that corporate presence in Washington, D.C. So this has become a very, very good deal, in my view, for the residents of the District of Columbia. And the, the bottom line, too, is that we became very concerned during this process that we were going to have a, a, a utility company that was kind of swinging the breeze by itself and would not have the financial capacity um, to make the long-term investments in what the district needs. Now, ultimately, uh, this is the decision of the Public Service Commission. Uh, we have put together a settlement just like uh, four jurisdictions have done before us, uh, just like uh, they did in, in Maryland. And uh, it's, it's, that's where we are. You went from opposing this deal to coming up with a new deal. Um, why do you believe the new deal on the table is more in the interest of rate payers than the previous deal. Well, I, I just explained all the elements of the of the deal, um, Kojo, and we kind of put it into several buckets. Um, do, is the deal uh, going to address affordability? And the, the answer is yes. Um, so we put in place, about, I think it's about a $26 million fund where residential rate payers uh, could be uh, protected from any increases that the Public Service Commission might approve over the next several years. This is what we believe. No matter who the company is, whether it's Exelon or Pepco, um, one, of the, those, one of those companies is going to go to the Public Service Commission over the next several years and ask for increases because they haven't done it over the last um, past several years. Um, and so what this deal would do is protect residential ratepayers for um, up to three years. And that's important. It also provides an immediate rate credit uh, for, for residential ratepayers. It's important to note, too, that this is a settlement agreement where uh, not only my Department of the Environment, who took the, the lead on really negotiating this terms, led by Tommy Wells, uh, was in agreement, but the Office of the Attorney General uh, was signed on to this agreement and felt very strongly about it moving forward. The Office of the People's Council, um, who is the ratepayers' representative, signed on to this deal and felt very strongly about it. So uh, we, we put together a deal that uh, is really in the best interest, we think, One of D.C. residents. Oh, 
proponents of the deal have called for an ethics investigation into your support of it, specifically into an agreement that the city reached with Pepco to offset the cost of building the new soccer stadium in Southwest. How do you respond to their impression of the negotiations you had both on the merger and on the stadium deal, and was there any connection at all? Uh, we had, uh, around the same time, uh, we were acquiring land to build uh, the soccer stadium, and uh, Pepco is one of the largest owners um, on, on Buzzard Point. Uh, and we had another piece of land that was part of, of this acquisition. Uh, and during that negotiation, we, we reached a, an agreement uh, that will indeed offset what the district had to pay. But it also was a win-win for us and the company uh, in that we secured a $25 million naming rights agreement. On to the phones again. Here is Jeff in Northeast Washington. Jeff, your turn. Thank you, Kojo. <clears throat> Mayor Bowser, um, we've got about 5,000 new housing units being developed in Northeast, and a lot of our green space is being paved over and swallowed up. Uh, when we need outdoor recreation, we need large areas for like a Glen Echo Arts Campus for education for our families and kids, uh, a D.C. Wolf Trap with an outdoor concert you know, stage, and we need, we need large areas for urban agriculture. So it's hard for us to understand the, um, the sellout of McMillan Park. I knew McMillan acres. was about Kojo, to come shut up. up, Kojo. <laughs> don't, don't talk over me. All right. Okay, I'll have the mayor respond. How do you explain your support of the McMillan plan? Uh, McMillan is, a, you know, I, I was born and raised in Washington, D.C., uh, Kojo, and for almost my entire life, I've looked at a dilapidated McMillan. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is, un, is not being used, and it needs to be used um, productively. Um, so the discussion around McMillan certainly far uh, preceded my mayoralty and, uh, I, I, I dare say, my time on the council. Um, and so uh, what I want to see for McMillan is many uses, including a six Sacred Park. Uh, and so I'm actually anxious um, and I'm pushing my uh, economic development team uh, to make sure that we're really pushing hard to get something started at McMillan. Okay, let's hear what Jeff has to say about that. Jeff, your turn. Mayor Bowser. Yes. Yes, Jeff, go ahead. Oh, Jeff just either accidentally or deliberately hung up the phone which allows us to move on to Tom in Washington, D.C. Tom, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hello. Thank you. Um, my question is uh, regarding the crime in Ward 8. And um, most of the violent crime, to my knowledge, is committed by jobless and homeless youth and individuals. What kind of enforcement through the criminal justice system enforces the individuals to not commit the crimes. I'm not sure I understand your question, Tom. If most middle class working people, if they are arrested, there's a large financial burden. They have to pay for a lawyer. Um, they may lose their jobs. But people that don't have money to pay for a lawyer and don't have a job to lose and they just go through the criminal justice system and get out the normal part of life. How do you get those people to stop committing crimes? Well, I'm, I'm not uh, exactly sure I agree with um, the all of the premises you put on the table, but I think that the larger point is if people have more opportunity, will they not elect um, to commit crimes? And that is a, that's a something, uh, a notion that, that we support. And so we're working very hard. And you're right to point out um, that in some cases, people um, have significant barriers to employment. Um, they may have been incarcerated. They may have low literacy skills. They may have never, they may have no work history. Um, and so that's the place where um, the district has to step in uh, and do more to get um, those folks um, in, in employed. We're also, later on today, we're going to be at the D.C. jail talking about part of my Safer Stronger plan, uh, which will, with some people make mistakes, and um, once they pay their debt to society, uh, they should have the opportunity to get back to work. And so we're going to be talking about good time credits that will allow some people who are employed um, at the time of their arrest and 
sentencing um, to have a, a, a alternative way to serve their sentence so they can stay employed. Dealing with issues of unemployment in the District of Columbia has always been a priority with virtually every administration since I've been around, but we just discovered lately that, or I did, uh, the Labor Department considers D.C. a high-risk partner for job training and for employment programs. What can you do to fix that? Uh, well, we're, we're working on it, and I think there, there was a, I read an opinion recently that said uh, you didn't create the problem, Bowser, but it's yours now. Uh, and that's the attitude uh, that, that we take as well. I knew as a council member and as candidate Bowser that we weren't properly spending $100 million in, in employment training um, funds. Um, it, it, I was more recently... Uh, familiarized as mayor with the, the issue uh, with the Department of Labor, especially around our youth programs. Um, and so we're going to think of some real s simple but impactful ways to work our ways off that list uh, and uh, make sure that we're using that $100 million that is impactful, that's actually putting people to work. Um, so we have had, and I've been critical about the employment training programs that we've had in place, um, and other council uh, members of the council have as well because they see them as paying people not to put D.C. residents in meaningful or well-paying jobs. And we have to make sure we do that. I did something that some um, thought was... Uh, untraditional in appointing a uh, a restaurant tour to lead our Workforce Investment Council and Andy Shalal. Never heard of him. Has <laughs> tremendous ideas. In a couple of weeks, we're going to announce our new um, executive director also um, of the WIC. So we'll have a full team in place at, at the Workforce Investment Council as well as the Department of Employment Services. Andy Shalal, for those of you who are unaware of it, is the owner of the Busboys and Port Stores and also has a radio show on some other station. But here now is David in Mount Vernon Triangle. David, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Yes, hi, thank you. I'm calling to ask about playgrounds and safe outdoor play areas. Um, I live in Mount Vernon Triangle, and I'm actually sad to report that after more than 15 years, we're moving out of the district. And the reason is we have a two-year-old and another one on the way, and we're following the trend of fully three-quarters of the people on our floor in our condo building, which have all had children within the last several years and have all moved out of, um, out of the district or at least out of the neighborhood. And the reason is there are no safe – well, one of the reasons is there are no safe outdoor places for children in this neighborhood. Uh, there are no playgrounds and no place where we feel uh, that we can go with our child um, and, the, and the next one that are safe. Well, uh, that's uh, that concerns me, and especially I think I would say over the last eight to ten years, we have kind of doubled down on investments in our public facilities in Washington D.C. Um, that's not to say that we've hit every corner of the city. Um, and when I came into office, DPR had been working on a pretty comprehensive plan, um, which you know we put a fresh set of eyes on. Uh, but we will release that 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 plan and work towards the investments needed. Needed to make sure we have uh, great recreation, green spaces, playgrounds, um, and neighborhoods across the city. I got to tell you, though, when um, when I got involved in government, people fled. Uh, Washingtonians would go to Montgomery County to use all of their facilities, and now we see the opposite happening: that people are coming um, in uh, into Washington. Um, and I think the other thing that the the caller is right to say is uh, that we just have neighborhoods that ha have emerged that that have not always been places where people lived. Um, there may have been workplaces or other destinations, but not residential areas. So we have to especially c uh, catch up in creating green spaces. Got to take a short break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser. I'm Kojo Nandi. <laughs> Madam Mayor, it's been unseasonably warm so yes, far this winter, but the city has struggled in recent years with homelessness, particularly with homeless families. Council voted a few weeks ago to shut down the city's troubled shelter for homeless families at the old D.C. General Hospital. Where do we go from here? Well, I think that um, we're on... Um 
we're on a significant path. Let me put it that way. Um, first, I made it a priority. Uh, I recruited a great team of, of folks who have nationally known to help us combat um, uh, homelessness in the District of Columbia. Uh, we supported a very aggressive Homeward DC plan that the Interagency Council on Homelessness um, put together. And we put a significant down payment on that plan. So over the course of, I think it's five years, um, we have determined if we make that investment, we, sh we should hit our, hit our goal of making homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring in the district. Uh, we've also changed some things around family homelessness uh, in that, uh, you know, uh, Kojo, unlike uh, all of the jurisdictions that surround Washington, D.C., we actually have an entitlement uh, to shelter during hypothermia season. And what has happened in years past is that there's a crush of people seeking um, shelter um, at hypothermia season, and which strains the system to the point that we really aren't providing the human services supports or interventions uh, needed to prevent, prevent people from getting into a situation of homelessness. So we made a very practical decision. Uh, we didn't expand the entitlement, but we uh, decided to uh, take in uh, families throughout the year to give them the type of services that they need um, and hopefully make their experience uh, a brief one. Any uh, way we can pressure neighboring jurisdictions to make sure they offer the same kinds of entitlements to homeless people? Uh, well, we we believe um, that we are a neighbor's keeper and that in a <laughs> prosperous uh, city uh, that we have to help the, the, the people who are most vulnerable. Uh, and that also means helping getting them in employment, helping getting them uh, in housing first, uh, so that any other issues that led to um, their homelessness uh, could, could be addressed. Now, we have a pretty aggressive uh, plan also. Also, uh, you will remember uh, that people have been captivated by uh, D.C. General, especially around uh, the disappearance of a precious child. Uh, and uh, I think our city has uh, locked arms and said that we don't want families, even um, on the interim, uh, to, to use D.C. General as emergency housing. Um, so our plan, uh, we actually... Uh, uh, built on a RFP that was issued in the last administration uh, is to make a uh, smaller emergency family um, housing facilities across the city. Speaking of across the city, what concerns do you have about whether people across the entire city are on board until, you know, people tend to be supportive until they learn that the shelter might be coming to their neighborhood? Well, the, the thing about being mayor um, uh, that, I, that I've learned is that it's not, it's not easy, right? And it requires some tough decisions. And when people say on one hand um, that they want smaller, more humane, more effective facilities, uh, we all know that they have to go somewhere. Um, so uh, we have used our, our best uh, judgment and resources in, in trying to find uh, places that uh, would support families and also enhance neighborhoods. On now to Carol in Kenilworth. Carol, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Thank you for taking my call, Kojo. Thank you, Mayor Bowser, for answering questions. Of course. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I literally counted 106 ATVs and dirt bikes going past our house. And it seems like initiated out of the neighborhood and they went south on Kenilworth, which was unusual because they like to go against the grain well as well. And I was just wondering what we do in order to get this under control. It is a huge safety hazard in the neighborhoods and... It's just concerning. I got it, Carol. And it, it concerns us um, a, as well. And part of our attack on, on illegal dirt bikes has been to kind of get them at the source before they get on the road. Um, so we've asked neighbors to let us know if they see um, places where people are working on the dirt bikes or where they're storing the dirt bikes um, so that law enforcement can confiscate them. Uh, we've also kind of explored that uh, we haven't been successful yet um, in looking for some off-road places where uh, young people um, 
can can ride them more safely off road. And that's that's kind of a that is a that's in process. So we're working on that. Um, I know that people get frustrated because they see them on the roads and they want the police to stop. And one thing that we have and we will continue to support is a no chase policy. As police say, it's dangerous chasing them Very because they can dangerous. go in different directions. They can go in different directions. Places where police cars can't go. It, they'll get hurt. They can cause more significant accidents on the roadways, um, and it's problematic. So know um, that we take it seriously, and um, we're looking at ways kind of upstream before they get on the roads to stop the activity. Here well, I have called in, you know, reported and was told as long as it's on private property, there's nothing they can do. Well, that's not exactly true, Carol. So if uh, I would love for you to get in touch uh, with the mayor's office so that we can really work uh, with our MOCR team in your neighborhood and the police to make sure we're getting the right answers and the right amount of attention. So you're in Kenilworth. Um, so if you just call the mayor's office on community affairs and ask for Sharon Hines. Um, we will we will work with you. Thank you very much for your call. Here is John in Ward 3. John, your turn. Congratulations, Mayor, on a momentous first year in office. Thanks, John. Uh, I voted for you based on your fresh start promise uh, to uh, leave the unethical and corruption-filled past of D.C.'s politics. Well, I appreciate it. I spent personal capital on your homeless and affordable housing uh, initiatives in Ward 3, uh, knowing, as Kojo referenced, we have some appeal uh, battles there. However, in discussions with people across the city over the October to December window, there's been increasing uh, disappointment, Mayor, because of the bad optics of your intervention in the uh, Exelon Mass, the $25 million soccer gate issue, the, uh, the Fresh Pack debacle. So in order to start getting back on track and restoring confidence in you, would you be willing to introduce legislation to close the loophole in the campaign finance laws that Ben Soto and Chico Horton exploited to set up Fresh Pack? I don't know what loophole you're referring to. Uh, the one that allows uh, raising unlimited funds during off or odd year uh, cycles? Yes, I would support that. Excellent. Thank you. Jeff, thank you very much for your call. Um, Mayor Bowser, we don't need to play it for you, and we had a caller who wanted to talk about it, but that caller hung up. But in September, you predicted you'd be the streetcar, <laughs> would be carrying passengers by the end of 2015. Oh, yes. Didn't happen. No but one city, is more disappointed than I am, Coach. The city is still on the cusp of doing it. What do you see as at stake in the streetcar program and whether it can succeed? Well, um when I told you that, uh, we were here, actually. I think it was, a, it was one of uh, September, and uh, it was my expectation that we would be running um, by now. So I, I got to tell you, uh, I, I'm, I've been very disappointed by it. But at the same time, I know that we can only run um, when our, our safety officials say it's safe to do so. Uh, so we're now in uh, the phase of testing called pre-revenue operations, um, where the streetcar runs on a schedule as if it would, um, as if it was carrying passengers. After that 21-day period, and we must be um, more than halfway through that now, um, that is turned over to our safety office who identifies and explores any um, any issues that came up during that period of time. Uh, and they have up to several weeks to do that review. Uh, and they can tell us if, it, if it's a go or if it's not a go. Here is Rich in Washington. Rich, your turn. Yes, uh, thank you both for this fine show. I have a quick question, but a big one. W w Mayor, what will you be doing to advance full voting rights in the U.S. Congress? And might it be a good strategy to begin with um, a win for voting in the House of Representatives? I didn't hear the second part of your question. Might it not be a good strategy to go for a win in the House of Representatives first? Well, I have, um, over the, the, the course of my public life, so supported uh, stages to uh, to get to statehood, um, including, you know, what was to be the compromise to get us a vote uh, in in the 
in the House. Uh, I, it is my view uh, that D.C. residents deserve statehood. They deserve two. We deserve two senators and um, our, our share of, of members of the House of Representatives. I have been frustrated, as I have shared over the years, that, that we have um, pursued the same strategies over and over again uh, without much success. And it is true that we have big political hurdles, uh, even bigger now, um, that uh, many people in leadership have stated that they're against statehood. I, I do have, we have an idea um, that we're working on that um, is not quite ready to talk about, but we hope in the early part of this year um, to introduce a, a different way of, of having the, the question uh, answered. A bill before the council right now has put the city in the middle of the national conversation about paid family and sick leave. The proposed legislation would offer the most generous family and medical leave in the country. Are you planning on supporting that proposal, or would you like to see changes to it? And if so, what would you like to change? Uh, well, I'm quite sure that we're going to see changes to what's been proposed. Um, I think that uh, the members of the council who moved it uh, really uh, put out a, a marker of that no other jurisdiction in America has been able to um, to support financially, and that's 16 weeks of paid family leave. Um, what I've heard from the members of the council is that they support the notion, um, but don't necessarily know uh, that what's on the table is, is, is going to be feasible. Uh, we, of course, have to make sure it's feasible for the D.C. government, um, but that it also doesn't... Uh, uh, work against our competitiveness as a, as a place where businesses want to come in the region. Here is Mark in Washington. Mark, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Kojo. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor. Hi. <clears throat> um, I've lived in the STEM district for about 20 years. Uh, it's been an enjoyable experience. Uh, uh, got married, raised a family, etc. Recently decided to purchase a, a home that I needed to renovate. Uh, just a few blocks from where we, we already are in northwest D.C. Um, it took over six months to get through DCRA uh, and to get through the permitting process. Um, people we know have gone through equivalent permitting for equivalent uh, amounts of work in Montgomery County and were cleared for permits within uh, about four weeks. Um, I've never been more disappointed in my experience in the District of Columbia working with the government than I was going through this permitting process. Uh, it was abysmal when they sent a, they sent permit uh, they sent our our request back for everything from light bulbs to to a, a, anything you can imagine, um, and we heard various excuses and reasons why it was so laborious. Meanwhile, the renovation we're doing is next to a home where the uh, homeowner requested a permit five years ago in 2011, and uh, a very minor repair has had it renewed every year for twenty five dollars to avoid the consequences of basically having a vacant we, home. We only have and about a so, minute left. Allow yeah. me to have the mayor respond. Um, well, um, I'm disturbed by Mark's report uh, because DCRA has been one of those agencies. You talked about workforce training earlier. DCRA has been uh, the the agency that I have been pretty focused on since joining the council because whether you're a homeowner like Mark or you're building a downtown business or you're trying to open a restaurant, you have to engage uh, with, with DCRA. Uh, so we want to make that experience and uh, I've asked the question, and I, I'll continue to ask it. Now, we have some different requirements in our city because they reflect our values um, from the building code uh, to our green building standards um, that the, the outer jurisdictions don't have. But that should still not slow down the process. So uh, we want to work so that uh, we have the best reputation in the region, that one that's so challenged. Uriel Bowser is mayor of the District of Columbia. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Kojo. And thank you all for listening. I'm Kojo. Kojo Nandi.